want us to talk about Nigeria, the gangster's paradise, and the victim's hell. When I came up with the theme, Julio's song of the same title, stylized English, came to mind. I was never much of a rap music fan, even though I enjoyed the occasional lyrics, but the title is just apt when one thinks about the country called Nigeria. It is apt in the sense that it describes where we are as a people, who we have become, and what our country has transformed into. Nigeria is the gangster's paradise, and it is indeed the victim's hell. What do I mean? Let me place this in context for you. There is, or no, let me rephrase that. There are multiple documentary evidence of Mr. Adams Oshio Mole saying categorically as the chairman of the APC, you can decide what fits the acronym, saying spectacularly in public, join our party and your sins are forgiven. Join our party and your sins are forgiven. Let's disconstruct that first. What party, the conglomeration known as the APC, what sins, the crimes against the Nigerian people, the multiple crimes against the Nigerian people, those are the sins that the Pope of corruption, or shall I say the cardinal of corruption, pronounced and said, join our party and your sins are forgiven. The president of the country at this point in time, when the statement was made, was General Muhammad Buhari, the one who rode into office the back of anti-corruption. The one who rode into office as the champion of the Talakawa, the wretched of the heart. He was almost a mythical figure in the northern part of Nigeria where they believed that he would solve all the problems created by those who had looted this country blind. He was the president of the country when the chairman of the political party that brought him to power stated in the public space, join our party and your sins are forgiven. But Muhammad Buhari was not corrupt. Nah, he wasn't corrupt. He was worse than corrupt. You all were the ones who never got the memo. The man came to install the reign of impunity. And you all should have known, because you were adequately warned. A man was marketing anti-corruption, but he surrounded himself with the most corrupt in the country. I'll give you the background. Before the creation of the APC, there was a party known as the AC. That party, I used to refer to it as the party of thinking thieves. That was what I used to call them, thinking thieves. And I used to call the other one, the PDP, on thinking thieves. These are in writing and in several speeches. The essential differences between the two, well, let me just even point, there was only one key difference between the two. The AC, because it was obliged to play opposition party politics in order to survive, pretended, pretended to care about your opinion. So they bought the press, and they always had the narrative behind their stealing. So they would budget what they would steal. 
if that seem lost on you, remember the difference between two million and two billion. Remember the fragrance. That was that's how they do business in Lagos. They budget it properly and then they steal it. So there is proper appropriation. They give you the form. It is the content you never have. They will give you all the high falutin, big sounding English PPP. What they call PPP at any point in time is the, is part of the state privatized into Tinubu and his cronies' pockets. Jagaban PLC. Those are the beneficiaries, but they at least bothered to lie to the people. And to a very large extent, they cared to pretend to be working. So you find them painting bad roads. You find them putting traffic lights. You find them telling you, oh, we are doing bus lane, even though they do not create any additional lane. They come and put barricades and reduce the, num the, the number of lanes available to everybody. Then they take that privatized lane and then they give to their cronies. They privatize it thinking. They don't just take it and grab it by not. They, so they knew how to make it seem like they were working for you. That was the AC brand. The Tinubu franchise. That was the brand. That brand was the one I was referring to as the thinking tips. And then you had the unthinking tips. The PDP, brazen tea free. Those ones couldn't care less because there were no, nobody was checking over them. They were the ones in power for 16 years. They were just taking with, with reckless abandon without bothering to do paperwork. They did not bother with the niceties of all of that. It was brazen. So I used to call them unthinking thieves. They were the ones who bought, they would appropriate money for a non existent road. And they will chop it, and then they will appropriate money to build a bridge over a non-existing road. Those were their many years. So you now had a situation where a part of the thing, a part of the unthinking thieves, the Saraki wing, I believe that part of that, the thinking part, the ones who still had the capacity to recognize what was in their own political best interest left, formed an alliance with the thinking thieves of the AC. Then they went and brought the man with the magic in the north, Megeskia. They went and brought him with his 10 million votes in the north. Hmm? So when they brought that Megeskia, the aspiring thieves of the CPC aspiring thieves. They had never had the opportunity to steal. That is when I say they, I'm not talking Buhari because I, am, I cannot recall him ever producing anything other than to feed fat on Nigeria. So now, you have the aspiring thieves of the CPC, the thinking thieves of the AC, a, a faction of the PDP, then you have the Abga of Rochas, they came together and they formed the body and they came to you and told you they wanted to fight corruption. And you bought it. And it was easy to buy because what were they up against? The PDP that had 16 years to soil its pants in the public space so often that was hopelessly divided. Tinobu is the master of propaganda. He holds the Nigerian press almost effectively. The, the, the TV or rating, either if you don't own the TV, radio, or newspaper house outrightly, it is owned by proxies or owned by clients who will happily do as they are told. So the narrative is always shaped, and the Nigerian people got that narrative. So you have a new party. This party is not bound by the rules of any game. This is a they don't tell you what they are not, and you are you were warned. You were warned. So the aspiring thieves of the CPC, that wing of the APC, took power. Behind the man touted as the anti-corruption guru of Nigeria, <laughs> the patron saint of anti-corruption, Omar Buhari became the patron saint of the forces of impunity.
in the Nigerian state. APC was better, fully empowered, or restrained by anything called common sense or good conscience. A conglomeration, I repeat, of thieves and crooks. Not that the other parties are much different, or even the populace ourselves. We're a reflection of our rulers, or winners, as the case might be. But what we have today is a gangster's paradise. It is the gangster's paradise because the political class has effectively fused into one. And it is the gangster's class because it is the class that is now above the law. If you ever had any doubt about what I'm saying to you, look to the National Assembly. I see very little difference between the men and women that are sat in that assembly. There might be tokenist resistance to madness, and I haven't seen too many of them, except where selfish interest. Because the only time I have heard a voice in that Senate speaking against the madness going on in there was when the issue of minority leadership came up. Outside of that, what have we seen? One single Senate united against the people. Nothing new there. That's the way it's always been. So now, if you now have a political class, people essentially by groups, if you don't believe me, let's go take a look at our federal cabinet. Should we talk about Matawali? Just days before his nomination went to the Senate, literally days before, he was meant to be answering charges. The EFCC was all in him around. He sits in the federal cabinet today. Oh, I call you. Yes, now, you, you, have you forgotten? Yes, that night that Delta Commission probe, where they were busy explaining how these things were shared. That's your Senate president now. He was in the federal executive at the time when they were busy offing the mic. Where is Ponde today? In spite of the fainting spell in the Senate, nothing will happen to Ponde. Yeah. If it was me and you, a lot will happen to us. But it's the gangster's paradise. It is the gangster's paradise. You remember what they told us after the electoral heist in February? Go to court. Oh, yeah. The judiciary is the last hope of the common man. So the common man feels the pains of the reign of impunity. The common man runs to the court, the last hope of the common man. You even find that the system would use the court, which is meant to be the court of justice, to oppress the common man, the victim. Omar Elisha Ure has been the victim of the Nigerian state and its court systems for what? Like the last four years? Unable to step out of the country, meanwhile, those who are looting the country dry. They're going back and forth. Nothing is happening to them. There are persons who came all the way since 2020. They are still in prison because of NSAS. Some of them haven't been taken to court more than once or twice. And the state continues to deny their very existence. That's the court system. The last O of the common man that has become the tool of oppression of the common man. What about Chudi? How long before the judicial system realized that it should be left alone? What about the young man that was picked up in place of his brother, the publisher? What about Anolong? Look how long the judicial system 
was used to oppress and keep him down. How many more have been kept oppressed unjustly in prison because the judicial system, instead of providing succor, has become part and parcel of the problem and has become itself an instrument of oppression of the victimized. Where is the justice? Where? Exactly where is the justice? When it is the judiciary that is protecting the reign of impunity. If you thought that what Oshi Omole was saying was some fanciful nonsense. And I'm sure Molly has a way of giving what you would consider freedom slips, but which I know are just signaling. The other day he was telling everybody, if you cannot bear the pain of rigging, do not come into politics. The pain of rigging. That's the name of the game as far as they are concerned. It's not about democracy, so don't let's fool ourselves. And if you thought that was a joke, who is the chairman of the APC today? Gandola. <laughs> Gandola is the president, is the chairman of the ABC. That is them explaining to you. Look, even when a man as the executive governor of a state that was implementing Sharia <laughs> was caught stuffing money into Babariga, turning himself into a mobile Borrow the change. On camera, it does not matter. That is the person who sits at the head of the party that is ruling Nigeria today. You can rhapsodize all you want about our president, because he's not our president, whether we like it or not. You have Bola Ahmed Tinobu sat in the office of the Nigerian president. Yes. So, when are we going to open our prisons and let the victims out? Because unless somebody has committed rape or murder, even if they were robbers, as long as they didn't kill, I would honestly say that as a people, we lack the moral justification or basis to keep anyone in prison. We do not have any basis, either in equity or in law, to continue keeping people in prison. When we have signaled both to the old world and we must admit to ourselves that this do not matter, nothing matters. The victims. There are two classes of victims. Two classes of victims. There are those victimized by their ignorance. Ignorance may be willful, and there are times when ignorance might be the result of weaponized poverty and its twin, weaponized ignorance. But there are also victims. I consider myself not a victim. My consciousness makes it impossible for me to be victimized. But there are victims who should see that they are victims, but are incapable of seeing they are victims because they have comforted themselves with one of the prejudices that has rendered it impossible for them to understand the commonality of the afflictions that they feel and the one that the man whom they have been taught to hate also feels. I was speaking with a dear sister of mine, one of the persons I went to last week with, and you know, I have a lot of people I went to last week who are in the Lagos State Civil Service. So I was speaking with this person, and she was busy lamenting the excesses of the Tinobu Cabal within the Lagos State Judiciary, and within the Lagos State Civil Service, and how 
people have been overlooked, some people have pushed above the other choice. She was generally complaining. And then she said, can you imagine, she had been keeping files belonging to Igbos, not treating them because she too was high on the fume of Yoruba Ronu, Igbos are still in Lagos. And then I was forced to draw her attention to the incongruity of what she was saying to me. You're complaining that the system within which you are perpetrating evil is evil. <laughs> so you get it? You're complaining that the system is evil, but in complaining to me, you are also showing me how you have helped to facilitate the evil. Do you understand? So I think to a very large extent, the victims are sometimes self-victimizing in the sense that they do not recognize what is in their own enlightened selfish interest. Can we all agree that if the services were better, if the infrastructures were better, we would all be better off? I'm sure we can. I believe that to a very large extent, we can then form basis for cooperation behind which we can make demands or behind which we can unite to free ourselves from this nightmarish existence. This is a situation where the more divided we are, the more victimized we become because it is not in the enlightened, selfish interest of those who profit by our victimhood to do anything to change our situation. I say this to you again. We, the victims, are the ones who will have to find the unity of purpose to free ourselves. Let me say this. We will not vote our way out of this mess. It is impossible to vote our way out of this mess. At some point, we are all going to come to the knowledge of the fact that we would have to unite to throw off the yoke around our necks. Why do I keep preaching unity? I'll tell you. The more divided we are, the more it assures the continuation and longevity of our servitude. But when we unite around common purposes such as freedom, equal rights, better living conditions for all of us, not just for a few, future for our children, freedom for our race, there are so many things to unite behind. The faster and quicker we, as a collective, we throw off the yoke of victimhood. I see one of my brothers here, because I can see comments. God, I'm almost done, but I want to address this. So I should add my voice to the release of Mazin Namdikari. What a lot of you, at least those who have engaged with me on this issue, would know is that I am not in the habit of begging that anybody be released. If they carry me tomorrow, do not beg for my release. If they carry me tomorrow, hear me and hear me well, do not beg for my release. If a man is fighting for a just cause and a system in reaction victimizes the person, all it does is it propagates the message. Bola Ahmed Dinubu is not particularly smart, but just to answer that, my brother, I'm almost 100% certain that he will release the Namdekan before Christmas. He needs to win heart and mind somehow. And it actually does not make sense to keep that man in prison, especially when there is no lawful order 
But I'm not about to go appealing to anybody to release him. If they want to eat him, let them go and find Maggi, uh, Pepe. They, they can buy Tatashi. Mesuya is there as vice president. They can always go ahead and butcher him for all I care. That's their business. The question is, does killing Nambikano evaporate the cost he's fighting? I may or may not agree with his methods. That's a different ballgame. But what has he done that the Nigerian state has not condoned, promoted, sponsored in much worse proportion? So if you are actively interested in peace, I don't think that I'm not interested in appealing to anybody. They, they, whatever they like, they can do. So that's answering that. So in closing, let me just tell us. Find common grounds. Find common purpose. I'm not going to lead the revolution calling people into the streets when we are the ones who will be fighting ourselves on the streets. Hmm? The system will love that. You need to find common purposes before you can face your common enemies. Because it's the gangster's paradise. And in case you don't realize it, whether you are Igbo, Yoruba, Ausa, Fulani, Ijo, Anan, TV, whatever you care to be. Whatever you care to be. If you do not find the grace to unite, and I see you, Dennis, can a country battling with religious and tribal divisions unite? You had better find the grace to do so, or very soon you'll be busy taking pot shots at each other because this system as it is, is unsustainable. You are either going to save yourselves together or you are going to, at some point, begin to take pot shots at each other. Justice is the first condition of humanity. A country that thrives on dividing its people, refusing justice to the victims, will eventually implode. The totality of my own intervention is to show you that in spite of the many reasons why you have been divided and why you have remained divided, you must find the grace to unite. At least a critical mass must recognize the need to unite or you'll soon be taking pot shots at yourselves. The Igbo man is bad at you, mm -hmm. but you carry yourselves. You go and be living rough in Canada. The Canadians are not bad. I don't want to be taken away from my subjects. All I'm going to say to you is, this is the gangster's paradise. They can do as they please. The judiciary will never do anything to them. When you see the judiciary touching them, it's because there is infighting among themselves. It used to be that when they want to sanction each other, they will outsource the punishment. That's what accounts for Ibori. That was the basis for Alamie. They had to outsource the punishment because they know their judiciary has been hopelessly compromised. Now they don't pretend anymore. The judiciary is essentially an extension of the political party in office. In this case, we are dealing with a rapidly venal, murderous political party known as the APC that has today pocketed our judiciary. I say that with that equivocation. If you do not find the grace to unite and to then stand up as one, this gangster paradise we endure and your victimhood, we also endure. It's a new week. And you know what they say? A what? It's enough for the wise. If you like, hear. If you like, keep fighting yourselves. At the end of the day, they will pass you on to their children. Have you noticed that they started bringing their children on board? One was even going to become the FEMA chairman. There is one without NYC. He's your minister today. It's the gangster's paradise. Laws do not matter. It only matters when they need to condemn you. They get justice. You get judgment. That's what victims get. Have you blessed with? A word they say? Say enough for the wives. <laughs>